What inspired this animation is my recent email conversation with a semi-retired economist at the IMF who has moved in the highest circles of central banking worldwide. I will just call him Mr. IMF as his identity is not the issue. It has been my experience that every economist I've engaged has presented me with the same impenetrable illogic. At one point, he dismissed all my fact and logic-based arguments with this simple visual model of how he claims the money system works. I was intrigued by the five-year-old's comment that the water flowing out of the swan's mouth in the little pond in my front yard wasn't overflowing my pond while his smarter seven-year-old sister didn't understand why the water sucked up by the other swan wasn't draining the pond. I assured them that when they grew up, it would all make sense to them. In Mr. IMF's picture of how money works, the money just flows in a lovely circle from the pond to the input swan's mouth and back out the output swan's mouth to the pond. I don't even know what he is modeling. In this standard economics flow diagram, there isn't any money creation, banks, savings accounts, or non-bank lenders. It too shows a seamless flow. If it is banking or the whole money system he is modeling, he left out savings accounts and non-bank relenders. Can we build a water fountain analogy that more accurately represents the banking and money system? I think so. It is just common sense logic once you know the facts, and all of my facts have been verified by the Bank of England's 2014 report, Money Creation in the Modern Economy. All of my evidence comes from the U.S. Federal Reserve. First, we need a design that accurately reflects how banking is structured, and for that, we actually need just one simplifying rule to build our model. Money is principal debt to a bank on a repayment schedule. This simplification is justified because most money is created as mortgages or other time payment debt. Therefore, the outflow from the fountain swan must be a demand, namely the demand for exactly the same amount of water per unit of time that had previously been sucked up by its mate. This is because water entering the input pipe represents the principal portion of a bank loan that must be repaid in full. By whom? by the debtors all trying to stay afloat in the pond. In this water analogy, I shall make our starting point a demand for 10 liters per minute from a supply of 10 liters per minute. Now let's add an elastic storage tank to the system. This represents savings accounts at banks. The water in the pond and the water circulating in the pipes represents the available money from which all debts must be paid. Other than extinguishment of principal debt to a bank and the creation of new water via the input swan, nothing that happens in the pond can ever change the total volume of water. What happens in the pond stays in the pond. Previously, I showed you the standard economics flow diagram. All of that activity takes place within the pond. Now, let's divert a steady portion of the flow for example, one liter per minute into the tank. In order to maintain the required flow of 10 liters per minute, we need to increase the input to 11 liters per minute. But the output swan always demands exactly the same amount that came into the input in the previous minute. So if we increase the input to 11 liters per minute, the output demand also increases to 11 liters per minute. If we then increase the input to 12 liters per minute, the output demand also increases to 12 liters per minute, and so on. Because one liter per minute is still going into the tank, no matter what we do, we will always be one liter per minute short until the diversion stops. Let's imagine that the diversion stops when the tank is full to 10 liters after 10 minutes. The system is now in equilibrium. The full tank is overflowing and returning the one liter per minute to the flow. There is no further need for accelerated creation of new principal debt to banks as long as the outflow and inflow of the tank remain the same. However, the required flow had to be increased one liter per minute for every liter that went into the tank. 
therefore it is now 20 liters per minute. The demand for repayment of principal to banks has doubled in rate. Can the debtors keep up? Mr. IMF made these comments. There is a limit to how much debt people can service, and that limit comes from the size of their income. Debt is service from income. Default has nothing to do with whether the tank expands or contracts. I disagree. I just demonstrated with simple logic that expansion of the tank requires continuous acceleration of both the input and output rates due simply to the fact that money is created as principal debt on a schedule. Also, the total volume of water in the system has increased. How is that possible? It is possible because this fountain is a model of a bank. The input bank swan sucks in principal payments and extinguishes them. The input bank swan then creates new water as principal debt in response to the demand for it. The accelerated rate of flow is, therefore, the result of an increase in the total amount of water in the system. It is also obvious that for all debtors to extinguish their principal debt to banks, all of the water must be extinguished, leaving the system completely dry. Now let's shrink the tank and see what happens. By shrinking the tank, we are returning more water back into the flow. We can now reduce the input of water. The same governing rule also works the opposite way. The reduction of input results in a subsequent reduction in demand. Eventually, if we empty the tank, we return to the original volume and rate of flow of water, the simple equilibrium imagined by Mr. IMF. However, if we keep expanding the tank, water demand just keeps rising until, at some point, the real-world borrowers can't borrow any more. There just isn't enough additional water being supplied fast enough. The fountain swan gets really thirsty. If the same water is being recycled through several swan fountains, they all get really thirsty. Who are the other swans? The other swans represent every institution, business or individual that lends their own existing bank credit money. Because the non-bank swans relend existing money they own, the input and output are always the same as principal repaid is principal relent. Because all of them are relending the water from the bank swan, which was itself created as principal debt to a bank, every one of their loans is an additional principal debt of the same money. Therefore, all of the non-bank debtors are dependent on the bank swan always, without fail, maintaining or increasing the total volume of water. If the bank's input swan fails to do so, all of the non-bank swans will go thirsty. A swan going thirsty means, in the real world, mathematically certain debt default, business and mortgage default, losing homes and or jobs like millions of Americans and people in Europe did in 2008. Once we understand the model properly, we can accurately interpret the real world evidence provided in this case, by the Federal Reserve. Once we do that, the mystery of the thirsty swans and its relevance to recent history should be solved. Here is a chart over time of M1 in the USA, defined as checking and cash in the hands of the public. In our model, it is water potentially available to be earned by the public in the pond. Here is M2, which is M1 plus bank account savings. Savings are the water in the storage tank. Therefore, M2 is analogous to the total water in our circulating system. It's a harmless image if you only see money as water, a positive thing. If you see it accurately as someone's principal debt to a bank on a schedule, a negative thing, then M2 is total principal debt to banks, a big hole, and M1 is the small portion of money potentially available to fill it at any given time. Therefore, the space between M2 and M1 represents the proportion of bank credit money created as someone's debt on a repayment schedule that is not available to them. Why? Because someone else has it in their savings account and you cannot pay your debts with my savings, can you? Here's what Mr. IMF had to say 
about savings being unavailable to the debtors that created that money and need it to extinguish their principal debt to a bank. If people wanted to, they could pay off all debt and the tank would be empty. So what? Apparently, the complete lack of any reason whatsoever for savers to pay off the debts of borrowers they don't know and will never meet doesn't prevent this from being Mr. IMF's solution. And if all debts were paid off, there would be no money. I am baffled why he would say such a thing. Using our water analogy, whenever the space widens, the tank is filling up and expanding, requiring an ever-increasing rate of new principal debt creation to prevent mathematically inevitable default. Whenever it narrows, the tank is shrinking, returning liquidity to the flow and reducing the mathematical imperative to create more debt to banks. Whenever the space between these lines stays the same, we have a temporary equilibrium. The predictable results have been peaks in residential mortgage defaults and or business bankruptcies whenever the tank expands for a few years in a row, causing multiple swans to go thirsty. The gray areas indicate official U.S. recessions, the gold line, residential foreclosures. Here, M1 and M2 diverge. A peak in residential foreclosures follows. Again, M1 and M2 diverge, with M1 staying flat. What does that mean? During that span of four years, every dollar created as M1 checking someone's new principal debt to a bank on a schedule went into someone else's savings and stayed there. A recession and wave of business defaults follows. Then again, a recession with peaks in both mortgage and business defaults being the result, all to be repeated on an unprecedented scale in 2008. And note that since 1981, the only time the tank actually shrank and returned liquidity to the flow was the highly prosperous period from 1992 to 95. At all other times depicted, the continuous growth of principal debt to banks was a mathematical necessity to prevent mass default. By 2008, the gap between M1 and M2 had reached an unprecedented size due to increasing income inequality and resulted in the greatest wave of debt default since the Great Depression. Have I solved the mystery of the thirsty swans to your satisfaction? Facts, logic, simple arithmetic, and real-world evidence have been offered. If you think I am wrong, please demonstrate where my facts, logic, arithmetic, and or evidence are in error. Thanks for watching.